Hey everybody, it's Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Podcast, where we are praying for our friend Michael F. Florio. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, joined by Laquan Jones. No Michael F. Florio today, uh, as you probably could guess by the intro. Uh, where is so by the time uh, we release this, by the time you guys are hearing this, ideally, Florio is going to be in the air? Is that what we believe, uh, hopefully. Laquan? Hopefully. I mean, he's on a nine-hour delay right now, so hopefully he's getting seated right now and he's on his way. Yeah, uh, you know, he's uh, he was going to take a couple days, head back home to New York, see some family, uh, just kind of get out of town for a couple days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, stuff like that. Um, and he texts us, or he actually tweets out this morning that he's on a nine-hour delay because of some sort of mechanical issue with the plane. Uh, I believe at last check, he was able to get a standby flight that was going to leave at noon <sighs> Pacific time. Uh, which, you know, obviously it's several hours later, but not a whole nine hour delay. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> hopefully, again, by the time this is released and out into the wild, hopefully Florio has been in the air for a couple of hours and is on his way home. Um, man, air travel is rough, bro. It is. It's been bad lately. Like, I've been hearing delays from my friends and now Florio. It's like, what is going on with these planes, man? <laughs> I don't know. It's It's rough. I mean, look, here's the thing. Uh, as long as the plane stays intact all the way from here to New York, <laughs> yeah, that's the important part. You know, I mean, I'll take a nine-hour delay for that, right? I mean, <laughs> that's better than the the you know door flying off somewhere over Duck like tape on the side of the plane. Like, yeah, yeah we'll get there. <laughs> Don't need that. Don't need that. I'll tell you this: um, like train travel is awesome. And the only disadvantage for train travel is that obviously it's slower. Like if you, yeah. but if you have the time to travel like long distances by train, it is worth it. I don't know if you've ever done it. I um, haven't done it. The furthest I did was Jersey to New York. And okay, it wasn't but that's bad. Like, yeah, but that's like almost like a commuter train, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you're wasted by the time you get there. It's all good. But like, yeah, no, like I've done, so I've done. And I had no intention of talking about train travel on this show, but this is what <laughs> happens in June. Um, I've gone from L.A. to Dallas. And wow. I've gone from L.A. to Portland or uh, Portland, Oregon. Wow. Um, I, I didn't even know they. Wow. OK. Oh, yeah. No, it's Alrighty great. Then. Uh, it is great, especially because, like, you know, you spring for the cabin. Like, you get your own. I got my own little cabin and yeah. stuff. Um, you know, you can like, you know, look, I be honest with you, like, because like. You don't have to go through heavy layers of security or anything like that. So I had my bag packed. I bought a I brought a bottle of whiskey and a book. Oh, and so oh, in the evening, man. I'm just sitting in my room. I'm sipping whiskey. I'm reading a book. Uh, you know, you can order. You can either go to the dining car and have food, or if you don't, like you can ask the Yo, porter to bring legit. your bring your meal to you. Like I was like, hey, you know, I just I just want like a cheeseburger. Can you bring it at seven o'clock? <laughs> seven o'clock on the dot. They knock on the door. There's your food. It's so why don't people do this more? Because I mean, like, I mean, it's slower, right? Like, I mean, I went from LA to Dallas. It took like two and a half days. Like, same from like LA to Portland. It's super peaceful travels. Uh, The other part, sad side note: when I went to Portland, there are long stretches where you are in like you know foresty areas and you don't have cell service. Uh Um, And I was doing that once during the uh, the uh, Scott Fishbowl draft. Okay, and um. Like, I, I think I timed out at least once, maybe twice, yeah. because I was in a place where I had, like, zero cell service. There's no Wi-Fi. Yeah. At least at the time, there was no Wi-Fi on the train. Maybe they have it now. I don't know. But I would, like, get back into civilization, and, like, people were mad at me. Yeah. Like, I'm about just, to say people were probably booing you for the auto Just pick. mad at me because it was taking me all day, and I was just like, hey, sorry, y'all. I'm, like, in the forest somewhere in Oregon. Like, I don't know what to tell I'm you. I'm off the grid. I'm off the grid. Like, I I'm, I apologize. My bad. I probably, I mean, I probably I should have set up my queue or something like that, but like, there you, go. you know, whatever lesson learned. Now um, we know better. <laughs> exactly. But no, it was great. Uh, yeah. Susie, Susie's asking the question. It took from LA to Dallas. It was like two plus days. I spent two nights on the train. I had oh. two overnights on the train. Um, but it was a great time, man. I, I highly recommend it. If you have the I'm time to travel that way, it probably won't go to, to Jersey, that but uh, that, it might, it might, you might have to change trains somewhere along the way and it will probably take you like, four or five days but it's mm. it is it's a lot more relaxing than airline travel absolutely all, uh, all right um we're gonna talk about our guys that we like in drafts the guys that we are at least right now planting the yeah. flag on and riding or dying for now mind you it is june 5th and so that is likely to change as we get a little bit closer to the season so we will do this again 
once we get closer to the start of the NFL season. But for now, Laquan and I each have three guys that we are planting the flags for. Plus, we'll also talk a little bit of defense and special teams. I know that not everybody you know rocks like that, and that's fine. But uh, LQ, you have been doing some studying on this. Yeah. And uh, I know you've got some theories about it. And maybe, just maybe, uh, we can come up with some sort of arguments to convince you guys either to leave it in your current formats or bring it back in case you have uh, gotten rid yeah. of it. So uh, we will we'll spice it up. Spice Stop it up. being boring. Bit. Exactly. Finish supposed uh, to be know, fun. I, I feel like we are, we are heading toward a, a future where it's just quarterbacks, running backs, and receivers. Um, so I've even seen conversations about like getting rid of tight ends too, which is like, crazy. Like as <sighs> soon as Travis Kelsey retires, they're like, all right, get rid of the tight ends. Like, no. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, I, like, I feel like it's heading that direction. I don't like it. So like, if we can start bringing back or at least preserving other parts of the game, it's yeah. like, you know, kickers are already an endangered species. They're about to go extinct in fantasy. Yeah. Um, let's, let's try and, you know, do our best, you know, world wildlife fund foundation thing for like defenses <laughs> and special teams too. <laughs> uh, before we get into that though, let's dive into some news headlines. Lines. At this point, it's mostly rumor and innuendo, but uh, things worth talking about. Uh, first, in Atlanta, B. John Robinson says he foresees the Falcons utilizing him the way the 49ers use Christian McCaffrey. I know we have heard this before from different running backs. Like, basically, anytime a running back gets like more than, you know, three targets in a practice, they're like, hey, he's going to be like Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, Laquan. Not as many guys have a similar skill set. Like Bijan Robinson has a skill set that yeah. does approximate what Christian McCaffrey can do. Do you believe the Falcons are actually going to use him that way? And if the answer is yes, does that mean he might be worth the 1.01? I think I believe this. I think with Zach Robinson, the offensive coordinator, he knows what he has in the building. So with Bijan having the similarity play style and Christian McCaffrey, I'm going to buy into it. But for 101, that'll be me betting against the actual CMC, how he's actually being used for the past couple of years. So I could see him in my rankings leaping Brees Hall. And I feel like you can't get it wrong with one, two, and three. Well, you can get it wrong. With one, two, three, but you <laughs> can't get it wrong with two and three. You know what I mean? So I feel like, you know, it gives a little leap, you know, over Brees Hall, where I feel like Bijan will be utilized the way that we were hoping him to be utilized with Arthur Smith last year. I think, I think that's the biggest thing. More than anything, I think we are all, as a fantasy community, just rejoicing that there's a new play caller in yes. town. Thank one you. that is one that is going to look at his player's skill sets and be like, I'm going to use this guy where he is best suited. Right. Right. They're not going to ideally take Kyle Pitts, make him a blocker and then, you know, <laughs> have like Johnu Smith throwing passes to Michael Pruitt or vice versa. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do see a scenario where Bijan sort of gets those kind of opportunities right like you've got yeah. two really good pass catchers in drake london and kyle pitts why not take a guy like Bijan robinson and use him as that i don't want to say swiss army knife i feel like that gets overused but yeah, that guy who but... can be that chess piece you move around right the way the niners do where yes mccaffrey is a running back by title but you'll see him split out occasionally you'll see him run actual downfield routes not just little outlets and dump offs I do believe that they can do that with B. John Robinson. Whether I'm going to use the 101 on him, no. Um, no. <laughs> no. <clears throat> and not because he can't be good and not because he can't potentially finish as the RB1 if things break right, but mostly because I don't have to. No. <laughs> like, now, I think you believe more into this, though, because we saw him run a, a ton of routes last year. He ran mm -hmm. the second most routes among running backs out there. So we know he can be out there, have his head on the swivel and be effective and make a huge impact in this passing game that, you know, desperately they kind of need, you know, some weapons outside of Drake London and Kyle Pitts to kind of step up and be able to drive this team downfield, especially with the Kirk Cousins coming back from injury as well. Yeah, no, I, I think all these things are very possible. And I do like the outlook for B. John Robinson. Um, I just, I because I don't have to spend the 1.01 on him to mm -hmm. get him. Um, I mean, I guess if I really, really wanted him and I'm sitting at one, but at that point, why wouldn't I take Christian McCaffrey too? Yeah, because exactly. Like, why, why would I bet against the actual Christian McCaffrey? The, no the, the range of outcomes is pretty narrow for McCaffrey barring injury. So why wouldn't I just do that? So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, talking the Bills, we're talking the Bills without Michael F. Florian, so hopefully he won't get too mad about this. Um, Dalton <laughs> Kincaid says he is ready for an increased role in 2024. The moment 
Buffalo moved on from Stephon Diggs, everybody shot Dalton Kincaid up their draft rankings because Mm -hmm. you look around, who's going to catch the ball? Gabe Davis is gone. Sure, Keon Coleman is intriguing. Khalil Shakir has some spike week potential. But who's consistently going to get the targets? And everybody pointed to Dalton Kincaid. Not can he, because I think he certainly can. Can, yeah. Will he finish as a top three tight end this year? Um, no. And there's a couple of reasons why. And, and I'm not saying he's going to be bad or anything. I just don't see him being better than Laporta or even Trey McBride. And we already know Travis Kelsey is the 1.101. And it's like, I feel like Dalton Kincaid does have opportunity to step up this season. But being what the system is and what little previews that we saw last season and Joe Brady, you know, being the offensive coordinator, his time in Carolina, he likes to spread the ball around. There's not going to be one guy. It's going to be constant weeks of like, this may be a Curtis Samuel week. This may be, you know, a Dalton Kincaid week, a Khalil mm. Shakir, et cetera, et cetera. He likes to spread the ball around. And he was able to execute that. I've said this before on the pod where he had Robbie Chosen have a career high. DJ Moore have a career high at that time. And even Curtis Samuel have a career high. And they both, well, all three of them finished inside the top 25 of fantasy points with Teddy Bridgewater as the quarterback. So we got to look <laughs> at this with you have an elite quarterback and Josh Allen. He's going to be able to deploy that ball wherever he wants it. And I think we need to be a little bit more more cautious of pushing Dalton Kincaid's ADP up too high because our expectations are going to be super high, but it might not be a week to week, you know, expectation that we'll be ready for to eat. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say he probably won't finish as a tight end, a top three tight end this mm-hmm. year, because I think you've got, uh, I mean, you know what? Screw that. I'm, I'm really thinking this out loud as I, as I, as I sit here and talk to you right now, <laughs> I'm going to say, yes, I want to get spicy and say <laughs> yes. Right. Because well, one, look, I think Sam Laporta is very much back in the running to to be the tight end one again this mm-hmm. year, right? I think yeah. I just think the offense l- lends itself to that. Um, I think Trey McBride is certainly a candidate to be in the top three. Obviously, Travis Kelsey is a candidate to be in the top three. Uh, but I think when you look at, you know, say Arizona, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to get a whole lot of work. I think they're going to run the football very effectively too between uh, James Conner and and Trey Benson. Uh, you know. I just look at Buffalo, and I think I think to do it, you have to be the number one option in your offense, first of all. And I think Dalton Kincaid's going to be the number one passing option for Josh Allen this year. So I think that goes a long way towards it. You know, I think for Travis Kelsey, there are more yeah. places for Mahomes to go now, right, with Hollywood Brown, with Xavier Worthy. Um, you know, I think, I think Mark Andrews has a chance to be there. So I'm going to yeah, sit here. I'm going to yeah. sit here in, in early June, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my prediction that your top three tight ends are going to be Sam Laporta, Mark Andrews, Dalton Kincaid. Ooh, that's what I'm man, saying. Man, the that's disrespect right for now. Travis Kelsey. It's not disrespect. He, like, he can oh. still be four. Like, that's still a really good season. But you're talking about a guy who's a little bit older. On He's a like team. 40. He's <laughs> not <laughs> producing. Um, yeah, except tra- you ever notice Travis Kelsey, when he catches the ball in the middle of the field and he turns around to run, right? Travis Kelsey turns around. Like, he's expecting to see a Scooby-Doo villain behind him. <laughs> like, it's just this very cautious kind of tippy-toe turnaround thing, and then he starts running. Um, yeah. Those are my those are my my picks to be the top three tight ends. No, I'm rocking with it, and I like it being spicy in June because I really think that there could be an outcome. If he's the number one target and they're getting touchdowns, and like I said, Joe Brady had Teddy Bridgewater to work with, and Josh Allen, I think they might create more scoring opportunities for him to have that high red zone presence. So I, I can honestly see, and I think he gets there by the catches and obviously by the touchdowns. Like Mark Andrews is another guy that kind of like slipped my mind. I did forget about him as well. But if anything, you know, he's top five. Yeah, I mean, look, Kincaid's a top five guy. I, I'm, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sitting here saying that somehow Travis Kelsey is going to completely fall off a cliff and be – terrible yeah. um but you know the times they are a changing so yeah uh, there it is <laughs> uh, a couple of things out of dallas mike mccarthy says the team would use quote two or three running backs uh side note to that deuce vaughn apparently is trying out as a slot receiver so a lot of things sort of in motion in the backfield yeah. for the cowboys and my question to you is does this mean it's just time to stay away from the dallas backfield yeah, this is definitely stamping it to where I don't feel like playing with this. I don't want the headaches. I don't want trying to figure out where's the value, which guy is going to be this week. And 
Deuce Vaughn playing in a slot, it's tis the season. We always hear these reports of this running back playing in the slot. I forget it was Antonio Gibson at one point, and the dude never played in the slot. Like, we right. never get those type of outcomes. So I really feel as though, like, this backfield is just still trying to figure things out. And while they're still trying to figure it out, I'm just going to kind of move on and fade at this point. You know, it's funny, too, you talk about that. And I, I feel like we've we've heard this for years, right, years, about, oh, yeah. this guy's going to be in a slot, right? And I remember right after David Johnson's big, big season, was that 2016 when he had his huge year? So. Um, You know, I, I remember I went back and looked at it because we got excited about this guy's going to play in the slot and that guy's – so I went back and looked at it. And, like, David Johnson, who at the time was, like, the gold standard of running backs playing in the slot – it was something like his snap percentage there was something. It was like below, well below 10%, right? Like it wasn't anything. And we're like, I'm like, look, if this is the guy that we're holding the bar to and that's his snap percentage, I'm like, let's let's just calm down on this guy. Yeah, let's just relax. Let's let's take a chill <laughs> pill and just enjoy that it's June. We're getting some type of news, right. but don't overreact to it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of at this point, though, where if, if Dallas is really going to go with three guys, then it's going to be a nightmare. And, and yeah. we said this over and over again. Two guys, we can figure out. We can figure out the division of labor between two running backs, and there's usually enough for both guys to be fairly productive. But if they're going to go with some combination of Zeke, uh, of Rico Dowdle, uh, maybe Deuce Vaughn, maybe somebody yeah. else. I mean, if there's a third guy that is coming into the mix there, uh, this is going to be disgusting. I think we all remember the Chicago Bears backfield with Khalil Herbert, Roshan Johnson, and Deontay Foreman. Very, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, 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 a lot of mouths to feed in that backfield where they all have different abilities and nobody really came out as a fantasy winner out of that, you know? So this might end up be one of those situations where we're constantly trying to think like maybe this week is Zeke, but I don't know, maybe it's Rico, but it's like, I, I can only do one or two. But when you add that third, it just becomes frustrating as a fantasy manager. Yeah, no, it really does. It's just really, really hard to kind of figure out. Because think about it, when the weeks that they hit, more likely nine times out of ten they're on your bench yep so you 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 fall in love with that and you're like oh i'm gonna throw him in a lineup this week and it's not his week so it's like why want to deal with that headache constantly week to week do not want um i mean i guess you could say they're all great they're, they're better in best ball, not great they're better in best better ball, in then, best ball. then yeah. you don't have to figure out what week to start them but it's just yeah it just the format like figures it out better. for you i think also <laughs> i was like i think worth noting is that the cowboy offensive line is not what it used to be no. So now you have multiple running backs behind an offensive line that is not one that is no longer the strength of the team. Um, it just seems ungood for our ungood. Our <laughs> yeah. for real. Uh, last little bit. Traylon Burks apparently working as a gunner on special teams. We're, we're going to talk to some defense and special teams a little bit later on in the show. But this is not the role. The Titans envisioned when they traded away A.J. Brown and replaced him with Traylon Burks. Uh, you've got Brian Callahan out here saying that he's going to maybe have to be a special teamer if he's not going to be a full-time player. Is it Jover for Traylon Burks? <laughs> is it Jover? <laughs> I think so, man. I mean, this is this is giving me Brian Edwards vibes where we have all these high expectations and then we get the comparisons. They compared him to A.J. Brown to beat a replacement, and I feel as though like it's not panning out to what it should be. I mean, we're two seasons now removed from when he was drafted, and I feel like that first-round draft capital to be falling to special teams, that is a huge fall from grace. And I, I, I feel bad for the dude because, you know, he had every opportunity, but, you know, health, and I, I just feel as though, like, the scheme maybe didn't work out for him, but they bring in these new toys with Calvin Ridley and Tyler Boyd. There's not really a fit for him, so he must... He must find his way on special teams. I mean, yeah. at least he's still getting paid. He's on the team. He's, he's still on the roster. Playing football, you know? Um, but I think, you know, obviously for, I think in fantasy, you can probably let go of the rope if this is where yeah. we are with him right now. Don't hold on too long. There's yeah. still Brian Edwards managers out there. I bring him up because really? he's compared. Yes, he was compared to the Terrell Owens and Randy Moss made in the lab that one year. And yeah. That kind of held people on for another extra two years, and it just did not. I, out. I mean, I, I, I remember drafting Brian Edwards. Me too. Was yeah. I mean, I think, you know, look, the first year wasn't great. I think I tried a second year. After the second year, I'm like, all right, this is just not <laughs> – this is not the move. I, I thought the Falcons, he was going to be able to make something shake, and he did not. 
Yeah, no. I, after the second year when it didn't work out, I'm like, well, this is just not the move, and I'm just not. I'm not that invested. So, so you, um, yeah, you're not that. Look, you don't hold on too long. You know when to let go. Oh uh, <laughs> no, I mean, don't don't get it twisted. Like, you know, ask Hytham Kalani. Like, he he still gives me a hard time about. You know, I I kept trying to make Michael Gallup happen. Like, I kept trying to make catch happen. <laughs> It was Michael so Gallup. good that one year, but I get it. You know, I get it. I don't but know it's if it's time. I don't know if it's because we share the same initials or what, but I just I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't let go. So yes, it is early June, but uh, yes, we are all doing best ball drafts. In fact, I should probably check to see if I am on the clock in any of them. It appears that I am <laughs> not, so uh, we are good at this point. But um, look, there are guys that we love, guys that we are trying to draft, guys that we find ourselves picking over and over again. These are the ones we consider my guys. Now, it is June. There will be things that happen. There will be news reports that come out of OTAs. There will be training camp reports. We will see guys in shorts and slow motion making athletic plays, and somehow uh, it will break our brains and we'll change our whole strategy because of it. But for now, <laughs> these are the guys that we love. So... Uh, we each got three. We'll go back and forth on them. Who is your first guy for the month of June? I will say you did steal two of my guys, but this is a very <laughs> good I, like, list. I made sure to like jump in first on the sheets. I'm yeah. like, I bet you we're going to have some overlap here. So yeah. As soon as I seen your guys, I was just like, this guy just took two of my people. I was literally just typing out. I did notes on. Uh, but my first guy, it has to be CJ Stroud. Like, we come on this pod, we talk enough about who should we get. Is it Stefan Diggs, Nico Collins, Tank Dell? The correct answer here is CJ Stroud. He's the biggest beneficiary yeah. here with this offense, and you know they're going to be clicking. I mean, he was able to have six 100 yard games with Tank Dell and Nico Collins and company. I know other people helped with that, but still, he was was able to do that now you add in a Stefan Diggs to that I think this number increases to where you look at the fantasy points per game and then you look at the division he's in I mean last year he performed very well he averaged 21 fantasy points per game in his division with zero interceptions I mean that's like six games locked in where he has QB1 upside so that's why I've been aggressively just grabbing CJ Stroud like he is the guy that I want as a quarterback yeah no I mean look he was amazing last year far beyond any expectations I think even the most optimistic fans had for him last year. And I think to your point, I don't see how you can add a guy like Stefan Diggs and get worse. Now, again, yeah. to your point, it's hard to rely on any or to, to predict any Texans receivers. I won't say rely on them because they're going to be good, but yeah. um, to predict who's going to be the guy in any given week in that passing game. But by drafting CJ Stroud, you get all of it. So yeah, you, you don't get have to all worry. of it. <laughs> you don't have to worry. Um, this is this is the part where I remind you I said the same thing about Trevor Lawrence last year and you know whatever. But um, <laughs> I'm willing to double down on that theory yeah. in 2024. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to stay with a quarterback, and I am going to stay in the AFC South, which is my guy, and I'm going <laughs> to give you Anthony Richardson. Yes. Um, Anthony Richardson, who last year in a very small sample size validated all the things we believed he could be um yeah. the reason we were drafting him the reason we were excited about him was because of his rushing upside um you know the fact that in what i mean a very short short stint but 25 carries 136 yards more importantly four rushing touchdowns in four games he was not afraid to take the ball over the goal line to take it in short yarded situations and sort of be that hammer um, you know, on top of it, we're still obviously waiting to see what he could be as a passer, but there were signs that good things could potentially happen with his yeah. arm. And there's a chance for him to continue to develop. Um, now throw in the fact that he says he is up to 255 pounds. That's a big boy. That's a large man is what that is. Six four, he's at six, four last. So last year he was listed at 244. So he's up 11 pounds. Um, hey, that's all that rehab, year. man. That's all that rehab. Apparently, chilling, relaxing, eating chips, catching up on reruns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw I saw a photo of him and, and Jonathan Taylor working together uh, at OTAs, and somebody oh, okay. said it was like a combined four hundred and eighty pounds of person <laughs> um, in that picture, which is yeah. Um, <laughs> but again, it was a small sample size, and look, the the reason we loved some of these guys who have that rushing ability is because of that, right? Like, yeah, those are free yards. Uh, and the, you know, throwing the touchdown upside, this is almost, 
it's almost free money on top of what you would get from this player as a passer. Uh, it's the reason we love Justin Fields. Obviously, yeah. the the idea of what Justin Fields' pro career is going to be is still very much up in the air. Fantasy wise, we were locked on him from the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, I think similarly, you you hear the same conversation about Jaden Daniels that, you know, we you know, we don't know what he's going to be exactly. We have our our hopes and our predictions. Um, but we know he can run with the football, and that's the reason people love him in the later rounds. So uh, usually about the time, the fifth, sixth round or so, that's when I'm starting to think about a quarterback, and more often than not, Anthony Richardson uh, is the guy that's there for me. Absolutely. Um, uh, your next guy is a guy that I'm – I feel like the ADP is starting to go up because I feel like everybody is. is starting to talk about this guy. I, I kind of blame us because we've been talking about this for like a while now, but Deontay Johnson is yeah. so slept on right now. And I really feel as though people are looking at his last season and what he put on paper and, you know, what he put on tape out there. But we got to understand the situation was horrendous, you know, with the quarterback play. And we see him going to, you know, shifting over to Bryce Young, where people are still questioning the quarterback play. But I believe that the that Bryce Young will have this bounce back where we saw Deontay Johnson have an elite target share with Kenny Pickett, Mitchell Trubisky, you know, a broken Big Ben. And I think Bryce Young is better than all three of those guys in their times when they were starting. So with this elite target share, he's one of the guys that are living in the seventh round that is getting off the board as your wide receiver three or four that has an elite path to a at least 24 percent target share on the offense that cannot be as bad as it was last year you know we have to have some type of progression forward and with the new additions I think that you know Xavier Leggett he'll get his work Adam Thielen still working that slot this offense has the ability to move forward and with the running back room as well with Chuba Jonathan Brooks and stuff like that I think that this offense would be able to convert on third down, get more plays, more time on the field, which equals more fantasy points for a guy like Deontay Johnson, who's still able to create separation and go downfield and make the big plays. I mean, lest we forget, Adam Thielen finished as the wide receiver 17 last year, 103 catches, over 1,000 yards. Insane. It's crazy. I mean, for a guy that we had pretty much written off, I think as a community, yeah. we we're just like, well, you know, his best days are long <laughs> behind gone. him. Um, you know, is he even going like to be the 40. number? One, is he even going to be the number one target in Carolina? And you know, then like you know, six weeks in, we're like, holy crap! Like Adam Thielen <laughs> is doing things. What's um, happening? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> if Adam Thielen can do that, De Deontay Johnson, I think, can surpass those numbers. I think he steps in as the number one wide receiver. He gives Bryce Young a target, a guy who can get open. Um, mm -hmm. you know, more consistently than anybody they had. And can get open quickly because I think that was the problem last year. Guys weren't able to get open quickly. Like, it mm -hmm. was in slow motion. It was like, which speed am I watching this video in? Because nobody's getting right. open and moving. Right. Um, I know this wasn't supposed to be a hot take episode, but my, my other big take for this season is that Bryce Young's going to be named the most improved player by the oh. end of the year. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. I, th that's the thing. I didn't even question his talent last year. Mm -hmm. We were more so just honing in on the situation. The O-line was bad. Yeah. They didn't really have a great wide receiver core. What do you expect for him to do at this point, you know? Yeah, no, everything around him was bad. Now everything around him is less bad. So I think Less bad. See, yeah, it's, it's less bad. <laughs> Not good, but I mean, less look, bad. <laughs> they still have work to do, without a doubt. But um, They need to execute all this. That's what it is. It is less bad. And I guess the benefit for Carolina is that they are in a division that still isn't great. No. Um, a lot of a lot of figuring out there. So they they could step up. You know, I mean Tampa won the division at 9 and 8, the Saints were 9 and 8, the Falcons were 7 and 10. Um, you know, I expect Atlanta is going to be better. I think Tampa is going to be competitive, but you know, it this isn't like you're playing in the NFC North. You're not playing in the NFC West. No. Um, you know, where you've got some actual dogs out there that yeah. they have to deal with. So, um, I mean, that that is, if there's a benefit for Carolina, it is that, you know, location-wise, uh, they're in a good place to be. Um, my other guy, and this is sort of maybe a, a weird one, but it's James Conner, um, mostly because of where he is available in drafts. I have found that when, you know, if I'm going more zero RB, if I'm not taking that position early, he's available, you know, a lot later. And... Yeah, I get it. He has been injury prone at times in his career, but when he's healthy, he's incredibly productive. He's still really, really good. Um, and the, the Cardinals use him in any number of ways. And I think he's only going to be helped by the fact that they will have a competent passing game this year. Um, 
having Harrison, having McBride, having a healthy Kyler Murray uh, means that the defenses do have to pay attention to that part of the game, which should hopefully open some things up for Connor. Uh, I just, again, it's, it's more about the ADP than it is specifically yeah. about the player, even though I, I do think he's a good player. Uh, similarly, I do like Trey Benson. I'm not ready to like make him one of my guys, but I, I am finding myself, if I don't get Connor, I will wait and I'll get Trey Benson. In yeah, draft because cause we know, you know, Connor's going to miss some games and, you know, usually it's toward the middle to the back end of the season. So it's like around playoff time, I definitely want to trade Benson, especially if this Cardinals offense is, you know, going out there and making big plays, showing up and showing out. So, yeah, I'll wait. I'll handcuff. I'm a handcuffer. I don't care. I'll say it. Yeah, I'm a handcuffer. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get James Connor in the eighth round and then I'll go two rounds later and get Trey Benson. I don't care. All I'll right. I mean, that. look, I, I don't hate it. So, but I James Conner is definitely a dude that that that, that I like. I guess when we're talking about veteran players, uh, it's time for your next guy. Listen, I I feel like this is crazy that you know Chris Godwin's falling in drafts as well as you know as far as he is, but he's such a reliable wide receiver where I can't quit him. I mean, you look at this past season; it was something new for him. I mean, he was playing majority out wide. That's not something he's been doing for the last couple of seasons, and he's playing 60% out wide versus 30% in the slot. That's not really where he creates the magic. It's not where he's the most productive. And again, he's going later in drafts where he's your wide receiver three or four. He's up there in the likes of where it comes to catch rate of a Cooper cup, a Tyler Lockett guys that, you know, can just hone in and just get the catches and make something happen after the catch. So he's a guy that I need on my roster, man. I need him in the little wide receiver three wide receiver four range because this draft is where you can go wide receiver heavy and then getting a guy that's going to have a decent target share as well like a 20 percent range the 22 percent range where he's going to be also involved in the red zone so you have the wide receiver coach coming out publicly saying that chris godwin's going back to be playing majority yeah. in the slot that is great news and his adp does not reflect anybody knowing this information which i probably just help you know move the up, but <laughs> hey i don't care but just go out there and get you a chris godwin he's my guy just because reliable hands are so important to me when you get a guy playing out of slot it is it is that thing about going back to the slot that i think gets a lot of us excited about what chris godwin can be he was so productive there before so now you're putting him back in that situation where yeah. he's comfortable again and again i think it's similar to to james connor where that that adp is so good uh for a guy that we know what he can be that I think it's it's interesting. And look, um, look, I think I believe I'm let me double check this before I just say this out loud for the whole world to hear. But um, last year, it was Chris Godwin who had the most catches in that offense. Ooh. He had more catches than Mike Evans. Evans had the you know the big splash plays. He had the 13 yeah. touchdowns. Um, but Chris Godwin had more catches. So, um, I mean, hey, reliable hands are still there, even though he had his lowest catch rate since 2018. So it's like get this guy back to where he wants to create magic and where he could be really productive and he can give us all fantasy managers some really good weeks, man. Like I'm not looking for much out of him as my wide receiver three or four. But when you get a guy like him, I know there's going to be weeks where he's going to have like 20 fantasy points and a touchdown or two. Yeah, no, 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that for sure. Uh, my last one, and uh, we're going back to Carolina. We spent a lot of time in the uh, NFC South here. Uh, hey, bounce back season. Jonathan Brooks, uh, first running back that was taken in the NFL draft, and that's despite coming off of an ACL tear, coming out of college. Uh, yep. It looks like he may be ready for the start of the season, or at least the early part of the season, which is certainly encouraging. I'm looking at Jonathan Brooks as a guy you can really roll with in the latter half of the season. And I know mm -hmm. especially in best ball drafts, that's important. You want you want your guys to be playing at their best in those last few weeks as you get to weeks, yeah. you know, 15, 16, 17. Such an underrated strategy in drafts. It is. And so I think Jonathan Brooks, like, you know, if you are drafting him, understand there will be a ramp up period. And I wouldn't even be totally surprised if you see Chuba Hubbard as the RB1 at the start of the season. But I think that's going to transition as you start to get midway through the year. Um, I am not concerned about Miles Sanders in the offense. Um, you know, and, but th yeah, I mean, this goes but this goes back to your point, too, about Deontay Johnson. Mm -hmm. It was part of the upgrades that Carolina made with their offense, understanding how bad it was last year. Um and, and doing everything in their power to try and get some help for Bryce Young. And so Jonathan Brooks is a guy that, you know, is a super talented player. 
uh, you know, at Texas was stuck behind, you know, guys named B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. Don't know if you ever heard of him. Um, you know, but got his chance to shine and really did well with it. Incredibly talented player. Now lands in a situation where I think he can outcompete everybody for those opportunities. Um, you know, and the, again, another one where the ADP is nice. You're not having to reach really high to get him. You can sort of get him in those middle rounds. And uh, as long as you have the depth to wait on him for a few weeks, maybe a month, uh, you know, six weeks, something like that, uh, I think he's going to be a, a really productive player for a lot of fantasy yeah, teams. I absolutely agree. And like going back to that underrated draft strategy, I mean, you want guys that are going to ramp up on the back end of the season when you're making this playoff push or when you're sitting comfortable, like, hey, I can go deep in the playoffs with this squad. And like getting a guy like Trey Benson or Jonathan Brooks, like as much as, you know, everybody down talked this running back class, they're becoming contributors and valuable pieces later in these drafts that are looking at upside to taking over the backfield. So that I 100% agree again, Jonathan Brooks later in those rounds. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, those are the guys that we love. We'll do this again, especially when uh, Florio is back. And uh, yeah, I'm curious of who his too. guys are since you stole two of mine. I mean, you know, jo- <laughs> Josh Allen, James Cook, uh, Dalton Kincaid. I'm, 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 That's I'm a joking. lock. I'm, 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 I'm joking. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do this again later this summer and we'll get Florio's guys uh, as well in here. All right. So. I know a lot of folks out there are sort of down on the idea of including DSTs. Uh, They're trying to eliminate them, or maybe they have already eliminated them from their leagues. Um, But, you know, as of now, there's still a lot of people who do play with them. And they still exist. Defense and special teams still exist as a thing in the actual NFL. So, Laquan, you have been doing some studying on this this offseason and and trying to uh, figure out ways to save what looks like an endangered species before it goes extinct. So, uh, I mean, overall, like, have you had any big takeaways from what you what you've researched about DSTs this off season? Yeah, I was like really surprised in some teams that I thought were like kind of middle to pack teams that were like not really high on the boards of like sacks and takeaways and stuff like that. But I was really impressed with some of these special team like notes. Like the Jaguars had the most return yards. And that's hmm. kick return and punt return in the league last year. And it's like, why aren't we rewarding these teams, you know? So, like, I think the way that we can improve the scoring and make it a little bit more fun, like, I've been calling this DST Plus, where we add those return yards. Like, we're kind of cheating ourselves now. Like, <laughs> you get points if they score on a punt return. You get points if they score on a kick return. But what about all those yards? Like, there's so many teams that are up there in the special teams that have really strong special teams that can push these teams above the league average of, like, fantasy points per game. So, like, you look at I, – I, I put all this on the spreadsheet. I'm looking at all these teams in the league average last year was 7.2 fantasy points per game. That is disgusting. Like, you wouldn't start a player for that. So when you (laughs) add in like these return yards, the league average becomes 11.4 fantasy points per game. I can work with that. I I think it's funny too. You you mentioned the, the adding the return yards. I mean, how many times have you seen a guy, if you have a a, a DST and you see a guy who breaks a long one, um, but then gets caught. Right. And, and you're like, well, that was useless. I mean, you, you get, (laughs) you get nothing, nothing for it out at all. So I understand why people are kicking it out of the league because in a way you're kind of cheating yourself. Like we, I feel as though the only way you can make this as fun is if you add like DST plus where the return yards, or I have this Mm. DST plus plus where you add in sack yards, where you can Mm. try to get points on every single, you know, play of where the special teams needs to be included in DST. Like I, I just feel as though we're cheating ourselves here, man. And I I was about to say, like, you look at a team last year, like the Packers, they were ranked 21st in standard DST scoring. Mm -hmm. They led the league in kick return yards. Shouldn't they be rewarded for that? No, like they go from if you add the DST plus with return yards, they go from the 21st defense to ranked 11th best averaging 12.5 fantasy points per game. That is incredible. Like we kind of need to have these back into leagues because they bring in valuable points. Like how many times have you lost because your kicker missed a bunch of points? Or your defense gave up like 40 points. Yeah. But they had really good special teams. They had a lot of yards, but you got no points for it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that's that's important, especially when you talk about in the actual game, 
how important special teams can be in terms of changing a game. How you know if, if you have a good uh, a good punter or a good punt returner, how you can yeah. flip the field a lot of times and really set things up for your offense. I like the idea of including sack yards uh, as part of this as well. I mean, like sack yardage comes off of your overall passing totals, your team passing totals. Um, mm-hmm. I think defensively you should get some reward for that as well. You know, I mean, like yeah. it's, it, it's wild. You have a quarterback who scrambles around and somehow gets you know tackled 10 yards behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, that's cool. You get yeah. two points for it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. it right now. Like, why? <laughs> like, no, I need more than that. Yeah, um, I, I kind of like some of this stuff. Um, yeah. Just curious, like when you, you know, in leagues you play in that still do have defenses. Mm hmm. What sort of things do you look at? Because I feel like, you know, a lot of us just look at it, we're like, oh, yeah, the 49ers, they have a good defense. I'll just draft them. Like, yeah. are, do you do you think a little bit deeper than that when it comes time to pick a defense? Uh, Yeah, like, the, t- the takeaways have to be there. And I think, you know, sacks are cool, but most of the points come from the takeaways. Like, mm-hmm. you're getting two points on fumbles, you're getting two points on interceptions, and et cetera, pick six and whatever, you get six points there. But sacks are only, like, one point. So you get a little extra cheese, and, like, I don't think you're going to be seeing, you know, the sacks rack up in the game unless you're playing the Panthers last year. Where, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different situation. Panthers, but... the commanders. That <laughs> in, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But like you look at teams that like, it, like I bring DST plus again, like you look at teams like the saints who were kind of middle of the pack and sacks, but they made up for it with the turnovers. Now you add in DST plus you get more options to look at and lean on with these different teams. Cause you add in the DST plus with the saints. They had a top 10 special teams last season. I know that's, sounds you know a little boring and nasty but they would have averaged 13 point fantasy points per game and you look at these league averages with these other teams and i mean other positions and stuff like we're looking at 10 fantasy points per game with the wide receivers seven points per game you know with tight ends and stuff like that so they're going to be able to score more points than some of the guys you're taking flyers on would you I know some some a way to get around some of it is I know there's some leagues that give you individual scoring for yeah. defense and special teams, right? So if you have, you know, like if you have Cordero Patterson, right, and he runs a kickoff back, um, yeah. you get those points as opposed yeah. to like, you know, uh, having the whole defense and special team. I mean, I feel like there's also got to be a way to maybe incorporate that or maybe maybe that's all we do. Maybe maybe that's yeah. <laughs> maybe that's like, already a thing like that's done. Steelers are like one of the top teams that I have like in my rankings right now. I'm still messing with it. But Cordero Patterson, say you have the Steelers DST and you add return yards and then you have Cordero Patterson as a flex that week because, you know, the new kickoff hybrids coming up. You're double dipping in points everywhere at that point where you're getting DST six points for the touchdown and you're getting return yards. Cordero Patterson as an individual, you get the six points and the return yards. Oh, my God, man. This is going to be great for teams that are like Damian Pierce with the Houston Texans. I know tear drops down my eye with all these expectations, but (laughs) I think he has a role, you know, on kick return because I feel as though the Texans were a middle of a packed team. But looking at their special teams, that would have pushed them up in the rankings with DST. Yeah. Um, I, I love the idea. I know you didn't, you did a graphic for this, right? I did. I did. I sent it to you. Yeah. 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 We'll have to, we'll have to, uh, I'm like looking on scrolling. We'll do it in the cheat sheet or something. You know, we'll bring it up. Do a cheat sheet. Like, I mean, you gotta, you gotta like tweet this thing out though. So we can, uh, you know, so we yeah. can kind of look at it and like, figure this out. Cause maybe this is the thing people start adopting and maybe we'll send this to our, uh, our product team and say that, Hey, maybe yeah. we can, uh, you know, incorporate this some kind of Please. way. Please like, get DST back in leagues. Let's try to make it, you know, let's try to make it a thing. Everybody, I mean, like, you know. Get, maybe get Roto uh, Roto wear to start doing T-shirts that say like "Save DST" or something. Oh, like that. I would love that. <laughs> Hashtag Save DST. <laughs> Please make, we'll make that. It a thing. We will make it a thing for sure. Um, up next, we're gonna do kickers. No, I'm I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say oh, what? <laughs> Here's the thing though. I I'm a person who like I don't mind having kickers in the game because I I think I like the randomness of it. I think it I think yeah. it sort of levels the playing field. I think especially if you're playing in leagues with people who are of mixed uh skill level or whatever in fantasy um you know i think i think having that randomness is sort of a good thing i, I think i feel like the biggest argument for taking kickers out of the game is people would be like i can't predict them and i'm like all right man i can't predict earthquakes either that doesn't mean they don't yeah. happen <laughs> um so you know like i feel like we should have kickers in the game that's another conversation for another yeah. time we'll deal with that then um, speaking of the cheat sheet, we'll be back with you uh, tomorrow. Uh, it'll just be uh, Laquan and I talking some nonsense for about 25 minutes or so. Uh, hopefully, 
<laughs> Hopefully by then Michael F. Florio will have made it to his destination, uh, wherever he is. Um, and uh, oh, and a week from now, uh, we are tentatively scheduled to have Judy Batista on, yes. the, on the cheat sheet. I'm excited for this. One. Uh, so that should be fun. We should have her on the uh, on the cheat sheet. We'll have to ask her. We you know you'll have to reach out to her and ask her if she if she has seen Godzilla minus one. Oh uh, yeah. Because be spoiler good. alert, we're gonna talk about Godzilla minus one. <laughs> I have been hounding these guys to watch this movie for months. It is now finally available on the Netflix. Don't think I didn't stay up till midnight to watch it again. Um, and so we're going <laughs> to talk. drops. It was totally like I literally it was like 1207, I think, when I hit play on it. Like I had to go get my <laughs> snacks and everything uh, to be ready for Godzilla minus one. Uh, so finally, we can see it. We're going to talk about it on the cheat sheet as part of Florio's Film Festival next week. So you have to ask Judy if she has seen it so then she can contribute to the conversation yeah. as well. Um, anyway. That is it. Uh, we appreciate you hanging out with us. Thanks to uh, Susie Bainon for helping us put this thing together. As always, uh, shout out to you, Florio. Hopefully your battle with the airlines has gone successfully and you have made it home to your yeah. homeland for a couple of days before you return to us back in Los Angeles. But that'll do it for this edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Podcast. Stay happy, safe, and healthy. Do good and live well. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. And we'll talk to you again real soon. <laughs>